introducing Dr. Vic Gitzner. Together with us, Dr. Vic is God's child. He is also a husband, a father, and a grandfather. Dr. Vic is a Lutheran pastor and a teacher of pastors. For most of his professional career, he lectured at Luther Center, which is now, of course, a Sherman Lutheran College, mainly in the area of New Testament theology. He has also taught overseas, making a significant contribution to the development of the Protestant Lutheran Church in Malaysia. Dr. Vick is also a public member. Dr. Vick has served the Lutheran Church in other ways as well. He was a member of the Commission on Theology and Interchurch Relations for many years. It was during that time that our church began to address the matter of ordination. Dr. Vick has strongly advocated for the ordination of women and men in the Lutheran Church of Australia, our church. We are grateful for his membership and courage, and we look forward to his presentation tonight. Please welcome Dr. Vick. Stephen Fry, good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening. <laughs> um, I hope you like QI as much as I do. I, I love the show. He's a, a Jewish atheist, but I still like him. Uh, he's a very clever man, very gifted man, and uh, full of wisdom. I wish he knew his Lord as we know Jesus is our Lord. It's customary uh, at moments like this to give thanks to the organising committee for the great honour to address the gathering. Um, I don't think I can do that. Uh, I'm rather more scared than uh, thankful for this opportunity. But anyway, I simply hope that they won't regret their choice uh, of speaker for tonight. Where are my glasses? <laughs> New glasses last week, and I've already managed to lose one. <laughs> hope my wife is finding them now. <laughs> anyway, persistent pressure on the part of the committee produced reluctant acquiescence on my part, so here I am indulging in some envisioning, which in plain Australian ease means dreaming about the future. In this instance, I'm invited to dream in public, which is not as terrifying as it might be where I'm wearing pajamas. <laughs> Sharing my vision for the future of the LCA, in which women are full participants in its life and work, is made less guilty because I know that most, if not all of you, share that vision. And some of you may even have a sharper focus on the future than I do. And together, you will try this weekend to construct the picture of the future that we want to see eventually. <coughs> I say you because re that regretfully, that tomorrow I live for overseas and I can't be here. For one thing in particular, I'm faithful to the organisers of Time to Soar. I don't have to present a theological argument for the proposition. It's not that I can't, it's that I'm sick of doing that. It's been done before, and other people do it much better than I do. In any case, that's not the point of this meeting, is it? This meeting is a gathering of the already convinced, the already persuaded, I think so, most of you at least. The need of the hours for our own encouragement and for the conversion of others, being a change of heart. Now, I know that the other side wants to convert uh, some of us too, but I'm heartened by the fact that in my experience, the conversion is usually one way, <laughs> and that is from the no to the yes. I would presently suggest too that those conversions will probably be achieved not merely by superior argumentation, if by argumentation at all, but rather by firm witness and some political action. Meanwhile, as we saw above present difficulties and disappointments, we can perhaps gain a better perspective on what possibilities lie around the corner. Such distance can give us courage to share our dreams with others. What kind of dream are we talking about? Not all dreams are necessarily pleasant. Even when they are sweet dreams, there can be a disjuncture between dreams and reality. In your dreams, we say, implying that a fond hope is light years removed from reality. To dream, of course, can mean to escape reality, even the ultimate escape in which Hamlet speaks, to die, to sleep, the chance to dream, 
I as the rock for in that sleep of death, what dreams may come and we have shuffled off this mortal coil, meaning that this life mightn't be the end of terrible dreams, nightmares, well before we have performed our final fatal shuffle. There are the night visions that bring terror and we are relieved to wake from nightmare back to reality. But we haven't come back, we haven't come together here to share nightmares, although perhaps the present situation is something of a nightmare. We haven't come here to share possible lines of retreat from a frightened position. We dream for what we will yet see become reality, despite past disappointments and present impasses. <coughs> to be a dreamer can, of course, imply inability to grapple with reality, to run off into some mental retreat that offers a haven from an all too pressing reality. Yet the reading cry of Martin Luther King recalls the other kind of dreaming, the vision of a future to be anticipated in fervent hope. I have a dream, he shouted, and the thousands responded, we're with you, we share that dream, we're with you. He had a future, he had a vision of the future triumph of justice for Afro-Americans. And he not only announced that dream, he not only enunciated it, but he also pursued it. He wasn't an idle dreamer, but a visionary, who by refusing to accept the possibilities, foresaw eventualities. And if we do not dream of possibilities, they are unlikely to become actualities. If we do not dream of possibilities, they are unlikely to become actualities. Keeping the dream alive means firm commitment to changing the LCA's exclusion of women from public ministry by whatever means are available to us within the church. In Aboriginal culture, the traditional dreaming has created and sustained power. One can sing nature into being. One can, by singing, preserve it from falling into decay. Can't we together make our shared dreaming into a joyful song of hope that will help our vision of the future to become reality and to draw others into experiencing both vision and eventual reality? So my friends, dream with me. Dream with me of the time when the big butts no longer play such a debilitating role. You know, the big butts I'm talking about. They run something like the following. I believe that men and women have equal dignity in the kingdom of God, but women have no role to play in public ministry. I believe that the priesthood of all believers is a fundamental biblical and theological truth, but women are excluded from holding the pastoral office. Or again, women are just as capable as men of exercising a sacramental ministry but they have no right to do so. Which is a half truth, of course. No one has a right to ministry, not even men. It may be theologically true, uh, theologically okay to ordain, ordain women, but the church will be feminized in the process and men will abdicate their leadership responsibilities, which begs the question, of course, doesn't it? <laughs> and in any case, has this happened elsewhere? I know that I believe from churches, overseas, ordained women, but they are all liberal and not really Lutheran in their confession of Christ. <laughs> a good example of asserting one's own rectitude by condemning others, of course. Or another one, another one of those big buts. Yes, the LCA is very short of pastors, but women can never take the place of men. This is they're supposed to. <laughs> now, these are all ones that I've heard, you can add your own. Or another one I heard only just a few weeks back. No, I've never actually experienced a woman leading worship, but I know it would look wrong to see one in the pulpit. <laughs> yes, I have. <laughs> now you can add your own exclusionary butts to the short list. But let's do some positive dreaming. We dream of the time in our beloved LCA. Yes, we still love the church, don't we? Love hate relationships sometimes. We dream of a time in our beloved LCA when the daughters of Eve, the mother of life, can publicly speak the message of eternal life on behalf of him who is the way, the truth, and the life. 
We dream of a time when the heirs of Mary, in whose womb the eternal Son of God became incarnate, will in their pastoral speech and actions incarnate the Word made flesh. We dream of a time when members of the LCA going out from worship have difficulty in recalling whether the officiating pastor was a man or a woman. Not just because the owl helped to, to uh, obscure elements of gender. We look forward to the time when the power of the preached word has nothing to do with gender, but everything to do with revealed truth and the power of the Holy Spirit. We look forward to the time when those red fixed tags are no longer in use against us, when no longer when arguments are no longer pitched and as liberal, unconfessional, unlutheran, when the catch cry of gospel reductionism is no longer thrown about so readily in this debate. We dream of the time when there is no more talk of women trying to be men, when authority is no more synonymous with gender, when authority is traced back to the divine author of the spoken and enacted word rather than to genetic and chromosomal identity. We long for the message rather than the messenger to be at the centre of ministry. We long for the time when the first synonym for ministry is servanthood, when fear and distrust are replaced by confidence and trust. It's because the Spirit has been poured out also on us that we continue to dream dreams, including the dreams that both our sons and daughters will prophesy. The prophecy fulfilled at Pentecost, but not yet fulfilled in Australia and the LCA. And not least, I at least dream of the time when we join our Lutheran brothers and sisters in Southeast Asia, in Europe, in America, and elsewhere, in recognizing the call of, in recognizing the call of women to the ministry and officially confirming that call. In the last decade, I've been privileged to serve <coughs> annually within Lutheran sister churches in Southeast Asia, and I fervently long for the time I can say to them, especially to the women up there, who serve as pastors and as lecturers in theology, we have finally caught up with you. Finally. But it's not going to happen next week, and it's not going to perhaps even happen next year. How do we cope? How do we cope with the present? A vision for the future is important not only in making things happen, but also in coping with the present. We all need coping mechanisms, sometimes even to keep the dream alive. Given the present situation of impasse, inaction, and fear of open discussion of the ordination of women in the LCA, it's easy to lapse into bleak pessimism. It's easy to vent frustration and anger on those we hold responsible for blocking the pathway to change in the LCA. I think it's very important to share our feelings and experiences so that we stand in solidarity with each other, also in our anger and our frustration. If I may share some of my own feelings in this regard, I've sat and sometimes smouldered within through two decades of debate on women in ministry at meetings of the Commission of Theology and Interchurch Relations, including many hours spent chairing the subcommittee. I've listened to papers and debates at pastors' conferences at the district and federal level and at the congregation and zone level. And my thoughts have sometimes been decidedly dark. Now, we don't have to apologize for feeling frustrated and angry, but one thing we do need is to make sure that they, these feelings don't issue in disrespectful speech and personal animosity. Frustration and anger can be spiritually corrosive unless tempered by Christian love, patience, and hope. It's very easy, I think, to erect walls of separation by treating those who don't agree with us as our enemies. Forgetting, I'm talking about people in the church, forgetting that they are co-heirs with us of the kingdom, sisters and brothers in Christ. And it would be tragic, wouldn't it, if we who long for the practical expression of gospel inclusivity throughout the church were to shut ourselves off from those who disagree with us. <coughs> shut them off from us. 
A brighter future will become reality only surely by honest engagement. By inviting others to share our vision, by winning over those who fear what might happen to their debts if we give up past practice. Fear. It's a huge part of the problem, isn't it? What will happen to the LCA once it ordains women? It's the thin edge of the wedge. What other terrible developments will inevitably follow? While most of us in this gathering have probably experienced the ministrations of women in the pulpit and at the altar, the vast majority of LCA members have not. How many of you have been ministered to by a woman? Yeah, the majority. I thought that would be. If you ask a con the average congregation in the LCA, there will be a few hands. And so the unfamiliar easily persists as the forbidden as the forbidden, especially when it's given a theological basis. And so the present situation challenges us to counter a culture of fear. We are very right to feel a holy impatience with the present veto against women in ministry. But let's remind ourselves of some changes in the LCA. They provide that glimmers of hope for further change. Some of us are old enough to remember when women sat on one side of the church and men on the other. How many of you can remember that? Thanks, gracious, so many. That's incredible. In one of his novels, Colin Teeley humorously depicts the hubbub, the pandemonium in the pews when a young man, a Scandinavian newcomer to the Congress of the German community in the Barossa, enters a pew on the women's side. The concerted clucking and constellated craning of necks recall chooks disturbed in their nightly roost. <laughs> After all that frankness. What a terrible, terrible disturbance of the world. Holy indignation is the only response to such an offence against the established order. Changes in the LCA fortunately go further than seating arrangements in the pew. We can even now pray with Roman Catholics, the Anglicans, and other Christians. It's not so long ago that some of our pastors, okay, there are only a few, but some of them earnestly and fervently believed that Paul's argument in 1 Corinthians 11 about women having their heads covered in worship was binding in all circumstances and for all times. I must say, I was embarrassed to get out and read the exegetical paper that I wrote in 1972 suggesting that women wearing hats in church was not a confessional matter but a dictator of fashion. <laughs> I caught the job because I was the junior on the seminary uh, teaching staff here and was expected to obey my seniors. No one else wanted to write. While laughing at so much attention directed to a non-issue, we should recall that it's not so long ago that submission to male authority meant that women were not even allowed to vote at church meetings, let alone speak. Again in 1978, I had the great honour, I speak with tongue in cheek, to be asked by the College of Presidents to provide the detailed exegetical argument for women being allowed to vote. The result was a long winded paper presented to the General Pastors Conference at Parramatta. The memory of how the decision of the pastors and the subsequent synod eventually went the right way it doesn't remove my disease at reading what I once wrote with so much earnest diligence and zeal. Who would even want to talk about that today? I wonder how many papers have been written down through the years under the title, The Role of Women in the Church, or The Role and Function of Women in the LCA. Such talk of the role is classic stereotype. Can anyone here remember a paper being presented at CTICR or a pastor's conference or in a congregation on the role of men in the church? Okay. Is ontological masculinity a special divine vocation? <laughs> being man is a special divine vocation? Can anyone truthfully deny that discrimination on the basis of gender is sad evidence of continuing patriarchal attitudes and structures in the church when they have no place in society generally. <coughs> but back to our history, it's not so long ago that no woman could chair a commission or board of the LCA. 
It took quite a revolution for this seminary to admit its first woman student of theology, Ilza Berner. Sadly, she passed away a year or two ago. She later graduated and proved to be an absolutely outstanding lecturer in Asian church history, teaching with faithfulness and courage for many years in Muslim Pakistan. You can imagine what a challenge that was for her. She couldn't even travel in a train with a Bible in her hand. So she covered it in brown paper. To enable this one woman to sit with the, in the classroom with men, all sorts of special arrangements had to be made, including negotiation with Rolf Mayer at Lutheran Teachers College. Do you remember that, Rolf? All kinds of assurances had to be given. But she wasn't even asking for ordination. She simply wanted a theological education. Meanwhile, there has been a steady trickle of women receiving theological degrees at Luther Seminary now Australian Lutheran College, and some of them going on to complete distinguished doctorates in theology. They are amongst us. Others have received theological education overseas. There are also increasing numbers of women on the teaching staff of Australian Lutheran College. <coughs> Excuse me. It's probably the case that recent years have seen more women than men in the LCA earn a doctorate in theology. More women than men with early doctorates more recently. So there have been changes. But, this is another big but, the sad fact remains that not one of our gifted and theologically educated women has been accepted for ordination. Not one. How long, my Lord? How long? So how do we work for change? I believe it's particularly <coughs> lay people who again lead the way, or can again lead the way, I should say. That's how the Lutheran Union took place nearly 50 years ago. Leading lay people, of course, in those days they were men. Leaders in the Lutheran Brotherhood, like, I think it was Wilch, wasn't it, in the ULCA in Fitzner, of the ELCA. He was on the wrong side, I think. <laughs> <laughs> People like that refused to accept the status quo. They denied that the theological arguments of the past should have eternal validity. There was a groundswell amongst the lay people. They had a vision, and the dream became a reality when the theologians and the pastors finally caught up. They too caught the vision and agreed eventually that the old theological arguments supporting separation were no longer valid, and we would ask were they ever valid. It took years for the dream to become reality, but lay initiative was a decisive element in the process. So let's not leave it to the theologians and pastors. It's not a matter for the theological experts alone. As one involved in the debate over many years, I'm not about to suggest the end of theological debate. On the contrary, we need to open we, we need to urge the opening and broadening of the debate throughout the church and on more levels than theological commissions, pastors' conferences, and especially appointed committees. Every member of the church has the right to have his or her voice heard without fear of recrimination, without pressure. At the present moment, there is a sense of all, or am I the only one who feels this? I think there is a sense widely felt that only a few are permitted to address the matter, and amongst the official few, there is not one woman's voice. Am I wrong? I think that's right. There is not one woman's voice. That voice must be heard. There is something extremely odd, not to say disconcerting, about a discussion on women in ministry conducted by men alone. In this connection, I must express my admiration for the bravery and uprightness of all Zillafahad's daughters. But those actually present at the pastor's conference in Victoria are both those actually present and those involved in the planning of the presentation. I think their actions attest the courage of their convictions and provide a powerful example of confrontation with dignity. Confrontation. Perhaps that's the key thought. 
A church that cannot survive a vigorous debate on the ordination of women isn't united in the first place. That is, of course, the irony of our present careful tiptoeing on eggshells so as not to disrupt the unity of the church. The disunity of the church is there. Whereas the real issue is how we deal with our existing disunity. Just bear with me for a moment. I, some of this might be a little bit ridiculous, but I'm going to fill out the vision of it. Let's dream. According to Article 14 of the Augsburg Confession, which is under the <coughs> title Order in the Church, quote, nobody should publicly teach or preach or administer the sacraments in the church without a regular call. The Latin phrase for this regular call is Rita Mocatus, rightly called, but he mean ritually called, doesn't it? With apologies to the Latin purists among us who know the difference between a Latin adverb, Rita, and an adjective, Rita, I want to envision the, per envision the progress of Rita Mocata in the church of woman in years to come. <laughs> Please don't hold me to the details. The first draft I have dates. And the lock was very wisely told me to excise the dates. I'm dreaming here, I'm not prophesying. <laughs> Daylight, 2000 and the principal of ALC has announced the admission of first woman into the pastoral ministry program of theological studies at the college. Quote, Rita Bocata is a woman of outstanding gifts, maturity in faith and courage, who has already completed some years of theological study, the principal reports. No, I didn't say John. John, I didn't put it into your mouth. But I would praise God if you were able to say something. It would be wonderful if you could say something like that. We reckon, continuing the quote, we recognize that courage is an important attribute since she is the first woman to be accepted for possible ordination after the LCA officially lifted the ban. It may be that tough years lie ahead for her in gaining acceptance from people in the pews, but for us now at LCA, it's a joy to the educating Rita. Sorry, Michael Kane. <laughs> Dateline, 20, 2000 and you fill in the details yourselves. The multi-awarded editor of the Lutheran, Linda McQueen, reports in the latest issue that talk two more women have been admitted to the pastoral ministry program at ALC. <coughs> Quote, inquiries indicate that several more will enter the program in the coming year. <coughs> Linda also notes that the College of Presidents has included two women in a special program pre preparing candidates for local pastoral ministry. Deadline 2000 and whenever. In his regular circular to pastors and congregations, the president of the LCA today announced that Rita Bacata had been approved for ordination by the College of Presidents. This is a momentous decision, he writes, since she'll be the first woman in the history of the LCA to be ordained. After ordination on the second Sunday in Advent, she'll begin serving as the second pastor of St. Stephen's Parish. <laughs> in Adelaide. <laughs> Provided the present incumbent agrees to have an assistant. <laughs> she will have a special pastoral oversight of the sister congregation in North Adelaide. Dateline 2000 and whenever. All seven women pastors of the LCA report that their ministry is now well received by members of the congregations which they serve. Rita McCarter, now serving in Box Hill in Victoria, acknowledges <laughs> that she and her sisters did experience some initial reservation on the part of a few members, but misgiving soon gave way to full acceptance. Quote, a lot of our good people were simply frightened of change. Once they saw that we didn't wear horns, they were more than happy to accept this as classes. She added with a wide grin. The other pastors, now serving in Toowoomba, Brisbane, Sydney, Perth, Adelaide and Hobart, agree with Rita. Pastor Mary Smith of St Andrew's Congregation in Brisbane suggested that she and other women in the pastoral calling did not think of themselves as pioneers. We simply do what the Lord called us to do, and we're thankful for the opportunity to do so. Her sentiments were echoed by Pastor Ilgar Zegnishieta. <laughs> Still a few Germans in our church, come on. 
the sediments were to by Pastor Irgat Zelish of St. Paul's in Sydney and Pastor Lee Sun Chong in Perth. Pastor Lee spoke at the recent General Pastors Conference on her work amongst Chinese immigrants from Southeast Asia. She said, there's never been an issue over being a woman pastor at St. John's. Most of my members and contacts come from Lutheran churches have been ordaining women for a long time. Pastor Conchita Ramirez of Hobart recently commented on, commented on the fact that people no longer spoke of female pastors and male pastors. Gender had become incidental in the whole court process and acceptance of pastors. Even my Hispanic background has no barrier to being accepted here in Tassie, she says. <laughs> I reckon I'd be even accepted in the Barossa. <laughs> 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 Pastor Rita Vakata today celebrated the 10th anniversary of her ordination. Letters of congregation were read out after a special service of celebration at St. Paul's Box Hill. Especially precious were letters from her sisters in the ministry of the LCA, as well as letters from the presidents of the church. During her speech, she recalled the painful years of waiting to be accepted as a pastoral candidate, but especially the happy years that saw her hopes for service fulfilled. She acknowledged the wonderful support she'd received from her husband. At the same function, Rosina Williams, newly assigned by the ALC to Box Hill Congregation as a vicar, was welcomed. Dateline 2000, and whenever Pastor Rita McCarthy was today consecrated as president of the South Australian District of the ALC. <laughs> You've got a couple of votes. <laughs> Noted for her outstanding gifts as preacher and pastoral counselor, <coughs> she admitted in an interview after the ceremony that administration would be a special challenge for her. She said, I don't intend to stop being a pastor just because I'm a bishop. Asked whether she anticipated resistance from any male pastors in the district, Bishop Rita laughed. Those days when gender was such an important and decisive issue are over. Thank God. After all, a third of our pastors in the LC are now women. And I don't expect them to make things difficult for me. <laughs> it, it's coming to an end. <laughs> last, last projection. Pastor Rita Vakata today announced her retirement from oversight of the South Australian District. I'm happy to finish my pastoral ministry where my journey, be, the journey began, here in Adelaide. What a joy and a privilege it's been to serve God's people, she said, after announcing her decision to step down. I've had all the usual ups and downs that any district leader experiences, but I retire with nothing but thankfulness to God for giving me the joy of service. In any case, I'm not retiring from all work in the church, as you may know, she said to reporters. Though as a comment was a reference to her new position as adjunct or sessional lecturer in pastoral theology at Australian Lutheran College, Pastor Rita modestly failed to comment on the fact that ALC and its coming graduation ceremonies will award her the honorary title of Doctor of Theology in recognition of her long years of pastoral ministry and leadership in the ALC and of her encouragement of women in ministry. The United in Hope will leave Dr. Rita Vercata at this point recognising that her story is not merely that of an individual woman, but of many people. How will it happen? If reality becomes anything like the dream, it will be because of the saints who listened to the painful experiences of rejection and surrounded every single reader with loving support. It will be because ordinary people in the pews have prayed, urged, pleaded, but these joyful days might come quickly and have invited others to share the vision and help make it reality. It will happen not because a few people continue agitating, not because one congregation espouses the cause, and not because some pastors stand in solidarity on, the face, on Facebook, as important as that might be. This is not a women's issue, but a fundamental question whether the fullness of Christ is expressed in the body of Christ, especially 
in the ministry of men and women together proclaiming the word of life. I wish I had an inspired step-by-step -step program to bring about the desired change. None of us does. But this gathering can hopefully come up with some concrete proposals. They might include steps like the following. A concerted attempt to invite fellow Christians in the LCA to publicly declare their support for the ordination of women. I think it's time to ask the submerged iceberg to become more apparent. <clears throat> An appeal to lead to the leaders of the church to allow an open discussion at all levels, including the Terry and the Lutheran. Yeah. Yeah. Including the yeah. Terry and the Thirdly, an honest assessment of the possibility of indivi excuse me, individual congregations in the LCA being allowed to call a woman as their pastor while allowing other congregations not to do so. Finally, a renewed discussion of whether the ordination of women is a fundamental theological question and church divisive, which I don't think it is. Um, just an aside, um, I was taught one of the first uh, things I learned in seminary was uh, there is no, what is it, order called no donus sum gubernari, as the sum ecclesium gubernari follow it. As I said, all this Latin, you had to learn all these texts. There is no order by which the Lord wanted his church to be governed. And church order, uh, uh, ministry, is part of church order. So I believe that that is a fundamental Lutheran position that we need to assert. Will the breakthrough come through a blinding flash of theological insight, hmm. a new exegetical discovery, with a superior logical argument to finally prove victorious over all counter arguments? <laughs> can we win the debate? And we win the argument. And the question is wrong. We want to win people over to understanding the wonder, the glory of sharing ministry. Having again, I must say this, being involved for years in the debate, I don't want to downplay the importance of clear and cogent theological arguments, but in the life of the church, reason without heart, ratio without core, in Latin, doesn't lead to the warm and vibrant living out of the gospel. Might I suggest the dreams will become reality not by irate confrontation, but by conversation and conversion. Witness with humility and dignity. The ordination of women is not the gospel, but it has much to do with our understanding of the gospel and the call to preach and enact both law and gospel. To see women in the public ministry may not be our highest goal in life. It can't be at the top of our personal ecclesiastical or ecclesial agenda, which is to live to the glory of God. But living to the glory of God also must surely include our earnest longing for the freedom of women in the LCA to serve Him and God's people in the pastoral ministry. So let's dream with joyful hope. God still works miracles. Thanks for listening. Um, you made it sound very easy. <laughs> I think you described it in a way that we can clearly see, um, in a way that we, I think, believe that it's immediately possible. So on behalf of all of us, thanks very much.